Amen. Praise the Lord. In just a moment, we're going to sing page 553, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll sing this wonderful song this evening. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, as we come to Thee, we're so thankful, Lord, that Thou art above all. We don't have to worry about anything else. We know that Thou art on a throne. No one's going to take Your place or Your position. Lord, we ought not let anything do that in our hearts for You. And I pray, God, this evening that You'd be honored and glorified in everything that goes on. I pray as we get ready to lift up our voices in song that we would sing praises unto You. Everyone would sing out and be ready, Lord, to worship You this evening. Lord, let us put away and put off everything that may cloud our minds or keep us occupied or preoccupied. Let us put all of it away. And God, let us be focused on Thee and Thee alone. I love You, Lord, and I thank You for loving me. How good You've been to me. It's such a blessing to know, to know You, Lord, as my personal Lord and Savior. I pray for the Jubilee this week. I pray, God, for Brother McCulley and their uh, meetings that they're having. I pray, God, You'd bless them tonight and meet with them. Help them. We'll give you the honor and the glory for everything that you do. It was in the Lord Jesus Christ's name which we do pray. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand. We'll sing page 553. <laughs> Come thou fount of every blessing. If you would turn over to page 577, then we'll sing, Amen. Brethren, we have met to worship.
Amen. Let's fellowship with each other this evening.
Praise the Lord. This time we're going to receive the evening offering. We want to remember our missionary of the week, Brother Philip and Sister Mackenzie Jones, if the ushers will move forward. We'll remember them out in California, that the Lord would touch them and help them out there and be with them and use them in the ministry out there, work in their uh, ministry that they've got going on out there. I appreciate Brother Jones and all that he's doing out there. God's using him, and that's a wonderful thing. We want to pray that the Lord continue to do so. And so I'd like to ask if uh, Brother David Walker, young David, if you would, you pray over the offering. You also pray for the uh, Jones family out there. I believe in Pasadena that God would touch them, help them, and be with them out there, please. Yes. That you do a mighty work, Lord, that will show yourself to California, Lord, and Pasadena specifically, God. Lord, I just pray for this offering tonight, Lord, that you take it, use it, Lord, and Lord, and we just pray it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. He's going to sing for us this evening. We pray for the Kenneth as he comes to sing. That the Lord will help you speak to your heart through song.
and inspiration. He's always strong when I'm tired and weak. I could search the whole world over, and he would still be everything. Christians, Lord, and do our part in 
not look for somebody else to do our part, but Lord, please help us to step up, Lord, and be women and men of faith. Thank you again now for Brother Seth and Miss Laura Beth and their children. And I pray, Lord, the very best for them. And I pray, Father, for all of the needs. Please help us to understand, Father, we need to be up and about your business. And I pray, Father, that you'd give us the guidance and the instruction and the help that we need. Thank you again. You're so good, Lord. And you're so faithful, dear God. And please, Lord, please help us. I'm so desperate, Lord. I'm, I'm in need of your, your help. Yes. Daily, Lord. Daily, I need you. Please keep me close to you. And I want to thank you again now for everyone that has come in the doors of our building, Lord. And I pray before they leave here tonight, they get something that would help them, that would prosper their way, Lord, as they walk with you. And if there's one here that doesn't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, I pray something that would be said, Lord, or done, and cause them to understand they need to be saved. They need to be birthed into your family by your power, Lord. So we just say, thank you, dear Lord, for our precious, wonderful Savior, Jesus Christ, our precious, wonderful Lord. We ask this in his holy name and for our sakes. Amen. 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 You have your Bibles, if you will, please turn to the book of Exodus, chapter 25, Exodus chapter 25, and we will pick back up where we have been, and see what thus saith the Lord in the scripture this evening. If you found your place in Exodus chapter 25, I invite you to stand and we'll begin reading in verse number 10, work our way down a few verses here and see what the Lord has to say in his word. Verse 10, the Bible says, and they shall make an ark of shittim wood, two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof. And a cubit and a half the height thereof. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold. Within and without shalt thou overlay it. And shalt make upon it a crown of gold round about. And thou shalt cast four rings of gold for it. And put them in the four corners thereof. And two rings shall be in the one side of it. And two rings and the other side of it, thou shalt make staves of shittim wood and overlay them with gold. Thou shalt put the staves into the rings by the sides of the ark, that the ark may be borne with them. The staves shall be in the rings of the ark, they shall not be taken from it. Thou shalt put into the ark the testimony which I shall give thee. Thou shalt make a mercy seat of pure gold, Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof. Thou shalt make two cherubims of gold, of beaten work shalt thou make them in the two ends of the mercy seat. And make one cherub on the one end, the other cherub on the other end, even of the mercy seat shall ye make the cherubims on the two ends thereof. And the cherubim shall stretch forth their wings on high, covering the mercy seat with their wings. Their faces shall look one to another toward the mercy seat, shall the faces of the cherubims be. And thou shalt put the mercy seat above upon the ark. And in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee, and there I will meet with thee. And I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims, which are upon the ark of the testimony, of all things which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. Let's pray. Father in heaven, 
I thank you for the word of God. I thank you for the scripture that's been read. And I pray, Lord, that you would uh, reveal unto us what it is you have for us this evening. Thank you, Lord, for everything that's took place here already, for the songs that have been sung. Lord, for us uh, singing our praises unto you, Lord, I want to continue to offer my worship and my praise. Lord, never to be silent, never to be silent, Lord, but to continue to praise thee. I pray, Father, that throughout the rest of the evening, that would be upon our lips, your praises. I pray, Lord, you would speak now and let us hear. Let us have an ear to hear, O Lord, what thus saith the Lord. Set me aside. Let Christ Jesus be seen, him only. Let me preach in the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit of God. I love you, I thank you, and I praise you, God, for loving me. How good you've been to me. Thank you, O oh Lord. How merciful you've been unto me. Thank you, O oh Lord. I give you all the honor and all the glory, for it's in the Lord Jesus Christ's name, which we do pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. Thank you for standing. I would like to continue this evening on the study in which we've been going through on the study of the tabernacle. I know last week we kind of took a break and went to Hebrews and looked there in Hebrews for a few moments in chapter 10, uh, but I do want to take this week and pick back up. Now, I will say we'll see Hebrews again probably tonight, a time or two, if not more, because it ties right in with the scripture here. Uh, but one thing I would like to point out as we begin, i got a few things I'm going to read that I've wrote down here. As we can find in the scripture, I uh, mentioned here a while back that uh, the tabernacle, everything there is a type of Christ. Everything points to the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, everything in that tabernacle points to Jesus. There's not one thing in there that does not point to him. There's not a shadow of one to come. As far as this tabernacle goes, there's one in heaven. We've already mentioned that this has been patterned after that. That's what the Bible says in verse 9, according to all that I show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle. So there is a pattern of one that they're getting ready uh, to replicate of the one that's in glory. And also, I believe we read one over in Ezekiel where we even think about one and find one there speaking of one to come. So now understand what we see here has to do with the God of glory and who he is and what he is. One thing I'll mention here is that the tabernacle was the place where God meets the sinner. It is the place where God meets the sinner. The Bible says in Exodus chapter 25 and verse 22, we just read it, and there I will meet with thee. The sinner would meet with God at the tabernacle. Now he meets us in Christ. The Bible says, I'll flip over in 2 Corinthians, if you want to turn there, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians in chapter number 5, in verse number 19, this is what the scripture says, that to wit that God was in Christ, you see where God was, he was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. And so now it's not that he meets with us or the place where he meets with the sinner at, being the tabernacle, he meets with them in the Lord Jesus Christ. So then we also see this, the tabernacle was the place where God reveals himself to the sinner. The Bible says in Exodus 29, and verse number 46, this is what the scripture says, And they shall know that I am the Lord their God that brought them forth out of the land of Egypt, that I may dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. It's where he reveals himself to the sinner. The Bible says, and speaking of how now he reveals himself in Christ in John chapter 14. Uh, that famous chapter there that often uh, gets read and quoted in a lot, but I'll flip over there and read a, vo uh, read a verse there how we see uh, that he has revealed himself in Christ unto us. The Bible says in John 14 and in verse number 7, If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. So he's revealed himself through Christ. You should have known my Father also, and henceforth ye know him and have seen him. 
Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. This is what Christ said. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? Has, has he that hath seen me hath seen the Father, and how sayest thou then, Show us the Father? So what the Lord says through Christ Jesus is, You've seen me, the God of glory has been revealed unto you. Amen. So he's revealed himself in Christ. We see he revealed himself to the sinner in the tabernacle. And then we see he reveals himself to the sinner now in the Lord Jesus Christ. We also see the tabernacle was the place where God dwells with sinners. The Bible says in Exodus chapter number 25, verse number 8, And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. That I may dwell among them. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 1, and speaking how now he dwells with us in Christ. Matthew chapter number 1, verse number 23, the Bible mentions there, speaking of the Lord, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. So now we find that he's dwelling with us through the Lord Jesus Christ. It also says in John 14, where we were just a moment ago, in John chapter number 14, verse number 3, the Bible uh, tells us this. It says, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, where I am, there you may be also. And so God dwelling with us through the Lord Jesus Christ. Then we see also that the tabernacle was the place where God speaks with the sinners. Exodus chapter number 29 and verse number 42, the Bible says this, This shall be a continual burnt offering throughout your generations at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord, where I will meet you to speak there unto you unto thee. Now that's what the Lord has said. He's going to speak with those there in the tabernacle. Well, uh, praise the Lord, in the book of Hebrews, I told you all we may be there sooner or later, but in the book of Hebrews, the Bible says uh, concerning the Lord Jesus Christ in chapter number 1 and in verse number 2, it says this, He hath in, or hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Now, how has he spoke with us now? He spoke to us through his son. That's what the scripture says. Well, in John, in chapter number 8, and I realize we're reading quite a bit of scripture right now, but hey, if the Bible's not worth reading, then we ought to just shut it and go home. Praise God it is. So in John chapter number 8, it says this in verse number 43. Why do ye not understand my speech, even because ye cannot hear my word? He's speaking there concerning how he spoke to us and spoke to them. Well, in John chapter number 1, the Bible says this in verse number 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So we find that he has spoken unto us through the Lord Jesus Christ. Then we see that the tabernacle was the place where God accepts the sinner. We find in the book of Leviticus in chapter number 1, the Bible says this in verse number 4. It says, And he shall put his hand upon the head of the burnt offering, and it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him. Now, he's accepting the sinner in the tabernacle because of the atonement that's being made. Now, he accepts us in Jesus Christ. In Ephesians, if you want to flip over there, the Bible says in Ephesians in chapter number 1, as we go in that direction, in Ephesians chapter 1, the Bible says this uh, concerning the Lord Jesus Christ in verse number 6. If you want to look there, we'll find what the Word of God tells us. In Ephesians 1, 6, it says, To the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved. You understand how you're accepted this evening? It's in the Beloved Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only way you're accepted. There is no other way to be accepted by God outside of through the Lord Jesus Christ. Some may, some may think they're going to be accepted by what they've done or how they've done, but the only thing you're going to be accepted by is the Lord Jesus. And that's how God accepts the sinner today. The tabernacle was the place where God forgives the sinner. In Leviticus in chapter number 4, the Bible says in verse number 20, if you want to look there, this is what the Scripture says. 
And he shall do with the bullock as he did with the bullock for a sin offering, so shall he do with this. And the priest shall make an atonement for them, and it shall be forgiven them. Now, in the tabernacle, it's where the sinner would find forgiveness. Now, we're looking how the tabernacle is a direct uh, pointing to Jesus Christ. And then we see not only was the tabernacle the place where God forgives the sinner, now he forgives us in Christ. In Ephesians chapter 1, we didn't have to go too far if you were in Ephesians. In verse number 7, in whom we have redemption. Through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Now you see, we are forgiven through the blood of the crucified one according to the riches of his grace. Hallelujah. That's enough to make anybody shout right there. And so thinking about how we have been forgiven in Jesus Christ, that's how we've been forgiven. And he's the one that has paid the sin debt for us, and he's the one that has forgiven us. Amen. Then the tabernacle was the place where God receives from the sinner. In other words, he's receiving something from us. In Exodus, in chapter uh, number 23, the Bible says in verse number 15, Thou uh, shalt uh, keep the feast of unleavened bread. Thou shalt eat unleavened bread seven days, as I commanded thee in the time appointed unto the month of Abiab, for in that thou camest out of Egypt, and none shall appear before me empty. In other words, when you come before the Lord there in the tabernacle, you wouldn't come empty-handed. You were bringing something. And therefore, when you brought something, that was a form of worship. And he received that from you. And that's speaking of uh, when he received something from the sinner in Exodus. Well, in Hebrews, I told you we'd be back there again. In Hebrews chapter 13, the Bible says this in verse number 15. By him that Therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. There's only one way that your praise is getting to God, and that is through the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how he's receiving from the sinner or from the saint now, amen, today is through the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. Now, you see, our lips should bear fruit this evening. Everyone that has come in here, there should be fruit coming from your lips. And that fruit should be thanksgiving being given unto God. And that's going to be through the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how you're going to bear fruit from your lips is praising him and giving thanks unto the Lord Jesus Christ because of what he's done, praise God, for what Christ has done for us. So that's just a few things that we find there that the tabernacle was where God met with them, spoke to them, uh, dwelt with them, and all those things that we see now, it is in Christ Jesus. Y'all remember, uh, I think two Wednesday nights ago, whenever we were in the tabernacle, I said that that word tabernacle literally means to dwell. And that's what we found over in John when we seen that he dwelt among us in John 1.14. Just giving you another reference to that word tabernacle. The Bible says, and he dwelt dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And so Jesus Christ literally tabernacled among us. He dwelled among us. And so this evening, when you have trusted Christ to be your Savior, he now dwells in you. He's tabernacled in you. That's where the Lord dwells, through the Holy Ghost of God. So just a few things there as we get started this evening in the introduction concerning the tabernacle. But first, I want to say tonight, speaking on the study of the tabernacle where we're at, I want to talk just for a few minutes or for a few moments about the placement of the tabernacle. The placement. I, I know we haven't necessarily seen that yet in this text because we find it in Numbers. If you want to flip over there, I believe it would do well for you to flip and look in Numbers chapter 1 because there's some verses that I'm going to read out of Numbers chapter number 1 concerning the placement of the tabernacle and concerning where it was placed and how it was placed. This is all important. It all matters when they're setting this tabernacle up. The tabernacle gets set up. It gets taken down. It moves with the children of Israel as they move along and they continue to go. And so when we look at where it's set up at or maybe the position or the placement of the tabernacle, look in verse number 51. The Bible says this of Numbers chapter 1. And when the tabernacle setteth forward, the Levites shall take it down 
and when the tabernacle is to be pitched, the Levites shall set it up. Now notice in this placement, there was a group of people that was going to be doing it. God had somebody set in place to put it up and to take it down. Now we know this, and we know the Bible says it, that God is a God of order. He said, let everything be done in, and decently and in order. That's what the Word of God tells us. So, Amen. And when we come to this, he's not just going to let it be chaos when his tabernacle is being set up. So he's got people instructed how to put it up, where to put it up. Then it says this, the Levites shall set it up, and the stranger that cometh nigh shall be put to death. And the children of Israel shall pitch their tents, every man by his own camp every man by his own standard throughout their hosts. Now we find that the tribes of Israel are set up with their tents in certain positions with their camp and with their places and with their placement. Then it says in verse 53, but the Levites shall pitch round about the tabernacle of testimony that there be no wrath upon the congregation of the children of Israel and the Levites shall keep the charge of the tabernacle of the testimony. Verse 54, the Bible says, And the children of Israel did according to all that the Lord commanded Moses, so did they. And here's what I want you to get an understanding of. We have the children of Israel's camps and, and, and their tribes placed around about the tabernacle. But there's some on the east or the east or whichever way is east here, some on the west and the north and the south. Then you have the Levites camped around about in the mid there or close to the tabernacle. Here's what I want to explain about the placement of the tabernacle. It wasn't behind everybody. It wasn't on the back side of the children of Israel. It wasn't bringing up the rear where nobody could really see it. It wasn't out in front and the very front of everybody where everybody had to look that way to it. But the way the camp was set up and the way things were placed, there were these tents all around it. And right smack dab in the center was a tabernacle. Right in the middle of everything was a tabernacle. It had the central location. It wasn't, I wonder where it's at today. I wonder where it's going to be set up this time. It's going to be set up in the same place it's always set up. It's going to be set up in the center of all the place. And so everyone that looks, they can look towards that tabernacle. Nobody's left out. Nobody's kept away where they can't get to it. Nobody's being placed on the, on the end where, well, I can't see the tabernacle. If you can't see something that's 100 50 foot long, 75 foot wide, then you, you need some spectacles. And I've got mine on, so I know I would be able to see it inside of the camp. But the thing is, now I want, I want you to get a little bit of a picture here. The Bible says they set up their tents. And every one of those families would have a tent set up. Now inside those tents was where those families dwelled at while they were there and as they were continuing to press along. Now, where were they going? They had a land that they were headed to. They had a land that flowed with milk and honey. Now, I think that's called nomadic people, those that set up in a tent and continue and set up again and continue. They're not uh, setting up shop. They're not setting down roots and going to stay there. Abraham was the same type man. That's what he was doing. He was headed to a place that God had promised to him. And so think about this. Around this tabernacle and all around it, there's a lot of tents set up. I mean, there's a lot of people. There ain't just five or six of them. Uh, there's millions of them out here now. And they're all set up in their tents. And their tents, the color of their tents is black. Now, some would say, what does that even matter? I want you to understand some things. When we think about the, the representation of sin and how we think of sin in the Word of God, you say, where are you going with this, preacher? Well, that tabernacle that's set up has walls that are seven and a half foot tall. Now, we've already learned that. We looked at that two weeks ago, how its walls that went all the way around it were seven and a half foot. Well, the outside of those walls was white. And if you couldn't see the picture yet, that on the outside of that tabernacle is a bunch of sin, it looks like. But there at that tabernacle in the sin of the camp, there is a righteous, a holy God. There is the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ that can be seen. It doesn't matter how far you go that way to your tent. You can look back and see that there's righteousness involved in the tent, involved in the camp that God's going to meet with his people in the camp. Now, I don't think it's by no accident. I don't think it's by happenstance that it's in the center of the camp. And here's what I'll say about that and regarding the placement of the tabernacle. In every one of our lives here this evening, I think that this is important, that the placement of the tabernacle for us, that the placement of the Lord Jesus Christ for us is in the middle, in the center of our lives.
lives. It's the focal point of who we are and what we are. Uh, families and husbands and wives and mamas and daddies, what it should be is that we have put the placement of the tabernacle in a place in our lives where our children and those around us know that the house of God is an important place to be at and to be with the people of God is important and meeting with God is especially important. And knowing that you're going to be meeting with God, others around you are going to think, you know that individual is going to be down there at the house of God on Sunday. You ain't got to wonder where they're going to be. I do believe in the Lord's day. I believe in being in the house of God outside of being on the lake somewhere. Now, I'm not trying to hurt nobody's feelings, but I'm just going to preach for a few moments. It'll be all right when it's all said and done. Amen. Now, I know one thing's for sure. There's things out there today, whether it be traveling baseball teams, traveling basketball teams, traveling soccer teams, they're traveling everything today. And I'm telling you, I believe Satan has put that on a Sunday to see how many people that he can get out of the house of God and keep them from coming down to the place of God where people's families can get help from God and meet with God. Amen. Now, I'm just, I'm just letting some things out right here. It's going to be all right. I, I may be just back up a little bit. So when we think about the placement, here's what it's about now. The, 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 the families would look and they'd see, look at the tabernacle. Look where it's located. What's going on over there at the tabernacle? What's taking place over there? Now, we done read, and I ain't got there yet, but we done read about the mercy seat and the cherubims there in between those mercy seats. And then what meets there in between those cherubims is the God of glory meets with his people. Now, that's called the holiest of holies. That's a 15 by 15 cube. And God was meeting with his people there at that tabernacle. It should not be a, a crazy thing to think that on Sunday, praise God, God's going to meet with his people down at the Cloverleaf Missionary Baptist Church. That on Wednesday night, God's going to meet with his people down at the Cloverleaf Missionary Baptist Church. But then it shouldn't be a strange thing to think uh, that I'm not going to let little Johnny uh, go running off down somewhere and not be at the house of God because he uh, thinks that maybe he's going to be a MLB baseball player one day. Hey, praise God for MLB baseball players that they love Jesus and they know the Lord Jesus Christ. But here's what I want you to understand. It'd be much better for little Johnny to be at the house of God and know Jesus than be anywhere Amen. else. Now think about it. What you place, what you place as the center point of your life is going to be what the children get a hold of. It's going to be what they see being the center point of your life. If whatever you make big, they're going to see you make it big. They're going to know what matters most in your life. And I think it's important for them to see that you believe that being at the house of God matters. Now, I do believe you say you got scripture. Yeah, I got it. Amen. Hebrews 10, 25. We can go back there and look at it again and read it over and over and over and quote it over and over and over. We ought not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. We ought to be around one another, exhort each other. We ought to be in the house of God. So when God meets with his people, I, I look, I know God can meet with us on a hillside and I'm hunting somewhere. Look, I have met with God on a hillside as I've been hunting, but I didn't do it on Sunday morning. Amen. Now, he didn't meet with me on like a Tuesday or a Thursday or whatever day it was. We were there in Cahutta, me and Brother Warwick. But what I'm telling you is, you better put the emphasis on God. He better be the one that has the emphasis in your life. And your children better see that. And their children better see that. And you better know that that matters. And that that's something that takes place. Because it wasn't that God said, you know what, I think just by happenstance we'll put it in the middle. That way everybody has to look at it. That way everybody has to notice it. I, I'm for vacations. I'm for vacations. I believe in going on them. If I can go on them, I believe in it. I believe in spending time with your family. You better spend time with your family. You better, because when you get old, when they get older, they're going to remember if you did or not. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you're doing that, you better keep God where he's supposed to be. In the middle of all of it, you can still keep God where he needs to be, amen. You don't have to forget about the Lord when you're doing that. Well, I tell you, we just got unhooked and unplugged. You know, we needed a break from church. No, you don't need a break from church. You need a break from God. What's the deal here? I ain't figured it out yet. What we need is more of the Lord. What we need is more God, amen. We don't need less. We need more. We found the placement. We find out where it's at. We find how it's located. We find the, the size of it. I know I said it here a while back. They're talking about how it's 75 foot wide, 150 foot long. And if you want to know what size that is, it's the same exact size as the concrete pad in which we're sitting on tonight. I mentioned that the last time we talked about it. I don't, you know, I, I, I don't, I, this, is, this is the way it is. I can't do nothing about that. It just turned out to be this size. But thinking about things that's going on inside that tabernacle. Now, I mentioned this last time. 
out of that seven and a half foot wall going all the way around, keeping out what needs to be kept out. There was one entrance. 30 foot wide, you could go in a gate. There was one way in. And there ain't but one way in. We know that. I've already mentioned that. I said it then. The only way in to the family of God is through the Lord Jesus Christ. There's more pictures involved in the tabernacle than anything else in the Word of God. Then not only do we find the placement, we find the placement of the tabernacle. I want to just for a few moments as we get back to where we're at over here, we're going to look at thinking about the pieces in the tabernacle as far as in the most holy place. The pieces that are in the most holy place. There's something to be said about these pieces that are here. They're not just there to be seen. These instruments, they have a purpose. Every one of them have a purpose. And thinking about what we see first in verse number 10, the Bible says uh, concerning what we've read, and they shall make an ark of shittim wood. Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. Concerning the ark of the covenant, Back in the holiest of holies is where it was found. That and also the mercy seat which we're looking at this evening. Thinking about that ark and how that ark was made. Now, I mentioned the fact that that wood was a wood that represents humanity. We know that the Lord Jesus Christ became flesh, dwelt among us. We see him in his humanity. But he said overlay it with pure gold. We know that gold speaks of his deity and how he was God in the flesh. Now, it has been wisely said, I don't know who said it, but I wrote it down thinking about how the gold made the ark precious, but the blood made the ark priceless. Without the blood, what good was it? It was the blood that was, a pla that was placed upon the mercy seat that was there. So thinking about that for a few moments, I mean, praise the Lord, it was made or it was overlaid in pure gold. And it had to be just as beautiful as anything could be. But thinking about the blood that was placed upon it that made the atonement for the souls of those that were coming in repentance unto the Lord God of glory. Now here's something else to think about. As I mentioned once before, on the outside, speaking of the actual tent of the tabernacle, not just the court walls and the gate, but the outside of the tabernacle. Now, it might not have been the, uh, the, the most to look at. Now, I realize that the white walls may not have been the most to look at, even in the courtyard. But it wasn't on the outside that is what really mattered. I mentioned this two weeks ago. It was what was on the inside that mattered. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says that he was not comely, that any man should desire him on the outside. But praise God, what was on the inside is what was more precious than silver or gold or anything. The, the blood, the bulls, the blood of bulls and goats and calves couldn't do what Jesus Christ done. Amen. There was nothing like His priceless, precious blood that He shed for us. So thinking about the fact that His blood was precious and what it was, we consider the fact with this ark. We think about this: the fact of the ark of the covenant and how it was a type. It contained some things. And you say, "What do you mean?" Well, uh, there was things that we find about the testimony that is found therein. We see that inside the ark, and I believe we find it over in Hebrews. What's in that ark? We find the rod that was budded. We find the bowl of manna or well, the homer of manna that's placed in there. We find also the commandments. That's the tables of stone that's placed out in there. Now let me say this concerning the ark and concerning the contents on the inside. We think about those commandments. You say, yeah, that's the law. How does that represent Christ? Well, we find this, that it was fulfilled by Christ. Amen. The Bible says this in Matthew chapter number 5. I'll flip over there. I'll try to hasten. Don't want to be too long this evening just want to give you what's on my heart in Matthew chapter number 5 and verse number 17 this is what the Bible says it tells us um, this concerning the Lord think not that I'm come to destroy the law this is coming right out of Jesus' mouth he said I didn't come to destroy it but he said this or the prophets he said but I'm not come to destroy but to fulfill that's what the Lord Jesus Christ done we found that the law came by Moses but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ that's what John chapter 1 tells us. And so we think about that, that the tables that it contained was fulfilled by Christ. Then think about this, the golden pot of manna that's down in there. We know that the word manna literally means what is it? You know, that's what it would mean there in that language. And uh, the, uh, In the English, we would come up with bread. That's what it is. It's just bread. Speaking of that, but 
thinking about that golden pot of manna, it was what sustained the children of Israel. And you say, how does that got anything to do with us? Or how does that got anything to do with Christ? Is it not Christ that sustains the Christian? Is it not Christ that continues to feed the Christian? Is it not Christ that said, I am the bread of life? And that's what the scripture says. I mean, Jesus out of his own mouth said he was the bread of life. And if you're hungry, praise God, you can get a bite and you can fill up. You don't just have to eat a little bit and walk away. You can eat till you're full and stay that way on the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. Amen. Now think about the manna. What the manna done? He said, just go out and collect what you need for today. All you need is what you got to have for today. It'll be suffice. Don't get for tomorrow as well. Now we think about the Lord. The Lord is sufficient. You don't need more than God. You don't need more than Christ. You have what you need when you trusted the Lord Jesus Christ to be your Savior. We find how he's a type of that manna that is placed down in that ark. And then we find the Aaron's rod that budded, which speaks of the resurrection of Christ, how that comes back out and how that come up. And that's how we find the Lord and the Lord Jesus Christ in there. Israel had, had, uh, had uh, to carry and to bear that ark. And think about it for a moment. That's what took place. That's why they put the rings in it. We talked about the four rings or read about the four rings that was placed and the Bible says in verse number 12 and thou shalt cast four rings of gold for it and put them in the four corners thereof and two rings shall be on the one side of it and two rings on the other side. That's how they were going to carry this thing. And then they were going to make the staffs and sit them and overlay them with gold and place them in there and carry them by the staffs and, the, and carry that by the staffs and the rings. Now let's put it like this. God had a way for things to be done. He didn't want them done opposite. He didn't want it done differently. He didn't want it placed on a cart with oxen pulling it. Why? Because when it falls off and somebody puts their hand to it, they're going to be killed. And then it's going to be set aside for a little while at Obed-Edom's house. And praise God, I can hear Obed-Edom still shouting today because it stopped by at his house. Amen. The glory had done come to Obed-Edom because of an ark that somebody placed their hand on it and done wrong. Amen. Then what the Lord had said for it to be done. They didn't need a new ark. They didn't need a new cart to, uh, to bring the ark in on. They didn't need a new way to do things. Why? God had given them a way to do things. Can I say this this evening? You don't need a new way of doing things for the Lord. If it's in the Word of God, you don't have to come up or humdrum something up to figure out how to come to God. There's one way to come to Him, and there's no other new way. He is the new and living way. It's what the Bible says concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. And so understanding some things about how God had uh, put together and divinely set things in order here with the ark is important. So we find this concerning the fact of the ark and how it was placed there. But then we see that this thing called the mercy seat. Look with me please. And the Bible says this in verse number 17, and thou shalt make a mercy seat of pure gold. The Bible says two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof. And we think about the mercy seat and how the mercy seat was going to be placed upon everything. Now think about this. It is the mercy seat that's covering up the law. It is the mercy seat that's covering up that man it is the mercy seat that's covering up that rod. You say, why does that matter at all? Well, we wasn't saved by the law. Neither could we be justified by the law. No flesh shall be justified by the works of the law, the Bible says. And can I say this about the manna? The only reason the manna came is because they murmured and complained. So and that would be a picture and a type of every time they looked down in there and seen that. Yes, they can remember we complained about that and God in heaven fed us, but it was because of our complaining, our whining, our griping. And then you think about as well that rod that budded. It was because because there was some rebelling against God. There was some rebelling against Moses. And they said, tell you what, do you take the rods? Whichever one that buds, that'll be the one that you know to go with. Amen. And so that rod being in there was also another type of them understanding of their failures. And can I say this? If it wasn't for the mercy seat, praise God, it's about enough to take this jacket off and just sling it in there a time or two. If it was not for the mercy seat, we'd all still be in trouble this evening because the law would still be what's showing, because the failures would still be what's there. But because of the Lord Jesus Christ, oh hallelujah, and because it's placed on top of the ark, and because it's covering all of our failures and all of our mishaps, and all of our sin, and all of our filthiness, and all of our bad things, and we have the ark is placed there and makes some blood placed upon that ark, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ and his redemption for us and our atonement for our sins. We think about the ark, we think about the mercy. 
mercy seat. Praise God. I've got this thing flopping around everywhere. Get it back on in a minute. We'll get back to preaching again. Hallelujah. And we think about the mercy seat and how the mercy seat was and how it was a pure gold and, and how the mercy seat spoke of how there's a God of glory that was going to meet with his people and how uh, there was some things. Now, can I say this? The Greek word for mercy seat in the New Testament is also translated, get this now, just for a moment, uh, propitiation. Hallelujah. What about that? Now, we know that he is the propitiation for whose sins? Praise God, my sins, your sins, our sins, what the Bible says. But then the Bible says this in Romans in chapter number 3, in verse number 25. I'll just flip over there. Now, y'all might not be too excited, but praise God, I am. So in Romans chapter number 3, in verse number 25, the Bible says this. It says, for circumcision verily profiteth. Now think about, oh, that's chapter 2, praise God, that's right too. But chapter 3 and verse 25, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Now think about that for a moment. The Lord Jesus Christ is that mercy seat, amen. The Lord Jesus Christ is that propitiation. That is who that is for us. So when they seen that mercy seat and when the, and the holiest of holies, now you had to be a certain individual to get in there. You had to be that great high priest. The high priest is the only one going in that, in, in to see that mercy seat. He's the only one going in when the God of glory has come down and to dwell and meet with his people and to be there between the cherubim wings. Now think about this for a moment and just this ought to light your fire. If it don't, your wood's wet. You might as well just be and just sit back and just try to enjoy something. But thinking about the Lord for a moment and thinking about how he come down between those cherubims and how there was only one that got to go in there and see that and actually got to be in the presence of a thrice holy God and see the glory. Now hold on a minute because this might help you a little bit. When that bell was written in twain from top to bottom which was his flesh when he was crucified and that given us access, praise God, we don't need. We have a high priest. His name's Jesus and we can go now and we can have the presence of God in our lives and we can go to the throne of grace and find the glory of God for ourselves. We don't have to have somebody else do it for us. Amen. Amen. We've got that. We as born again New Testament believers have that, amen. amen. We have that in the Lord Jesus Christ speaking of that mercy seat and how he is that for us and how the fact that the mercy seat perfectly fit the ark. It wasn't just, a, I'm talking about it was a perfect fit. It went, well, let's hammer it down on this side. Let's see if we can't get it squeezed in on that side. No, it was designed for that. Divinely designed perfect to set down and it sat down there fully covered the law contained therein and the and showing the sufficiency of Christ's atonement he was a perfect fit for the lost sinner dying and going to hell was when the Lord Jesus Christ paid that sin debt for them no one can add to the salvation God offers freely through the Lord Jesus Christ that's where we were last week in Hebrews chapter 10 verses 10 and 14 we find the ark of the covenant represented the person of Christ the mercy seat of pure gold represented the throne of God in the midst of his people. It was symbolic of God's presence and spoke of a place where God and man meet together. Now I'll say this. We can meet with God. Us. I'm talking about you, me. If you know Christ, you can meet with God. It don't have to be some mystical thing. It don't have to be something that nobody's ever heard of or nobody's ever experienced. You can meet with God. I mean, that's a real thing. You can meet with Him. You can commune with Him. Why? All because of the Lord Jesus Christ. All because of what He is and who He is for us and how He has been God, the God of glory, has been satisfied. Has been satisfied because of Jesus Christ. Not because of you. Not because of what you've done, who you are. That's not what satisfies God. What satisfies Him is His Son. What satisfies Him is what He's done. That's what satisfies God when we think about uh, this, uh, the most holy place and what we find in here and how the ark is there. We think about those cherubim, how they're stretching forth their wings and on high and covering the mercy seat. The Bible says in verse number 20, with their wings and their faces shall look one to another. Toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubim be. Notice they're looking one toward another. They're looking one toward another. We find that they're over, hovering over the ark. Now, we know what, what the cherubims are. We know where one cherubim was set and how he was set outside the Garden of Eden, how he was keeping back things from the tree of life. We know that they, are, they hold back, they protect things. 
And here we find them in here with the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat. They're upon that mercy seat showing how God in heaven is going to keep things and how it's going to last and how it's going to be. It's not going to change. It's not going to change. That, this is showing what is in glory, what is in heaven as we speak. Now, here's one thing we understand about the mercy seat in this day and this age in which we're reading of. There was blood applied every year to that. Every year. Had to, had to happen annually. The atonement had to be made. Now, this is why Hebrew says we have a better sacrifice. Amen. Amen. Why? It's not an annual thing. Amen. It's one and done. It's perfected. Amen. He hath perfected. Amen. That shadow of things to come is found in the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice in verse number 22, we'll be done. There I'll meet with thee. And I'll commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims, which are upon the ark of the, of the testimony, of all things which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. He said, I'm going to meet with thee there. I wonder this evening, have you ever met with Jesus? Have you ever met with the Lord? And then I ask you this, if you have trusted Christ to be your Savior, I'm not talking about some fantasy. I'm talking about real, factual, faith. Believing in the Lord. If you've trusted Christ to be your Savior, do you meet with God? Do you meet with God? Time with the Lord Amen. is precious. You cannot substitute that with something else. You can't substitute it. You say, why would you say that? Because people often tend to do that. Something else comes up in their life. But nothing can substitute meeting with God. They weren't going to allow anything to keep them from meeting with God. And you see, the center point, I'll give you this and I'll be done. I know I said that a moment ago. The center point of the tabernacle, being in the center of the whole congregation, helped keep them from idols. You say, what do you mean? Well, they're about to go to a place. They're going through lands. There's about to be battles won. Kings overtaken. They have idols in their lands. But that being in the center of everything, they look to that and they remember, that's the one that's brought us. That's the one that's got us here. I think about over in Joshua, chapter number 24, I believe it is, when Joshua's given his, some of his last words. He says, choose you this day whom you serve. If you go back and read verses 3 through 13 before you get down there to verses 14 and 15, you'll find that he said, I brought thee out of Egypt. I kept thee in the way. I'm the one that performed the miracles. I'm the one. We're talking about God. That's when Joshua comes out and says, as for me and my house, we serve the Lord. He makes a declaration whom he's going to serve. But you see, what? while they were coming through the wilderness... Here that tabernacle was, and it was a testimony of what God's done, how God's done it, how God's worked, how God's going to work. And I'll say this, you let him be the center of your life, and you continue to look to him, and that'll be a testimony to others, Amen. what God's done, how God's worked, how he's going to work. Study of the tabernacle is a very interesting study. And it's precious and rich with the Lord Jesus Christ and how he is seen through every bit of it. Father in heaven, I love you and I thank you and I praise you. Thank you for the word of God. I pray, God, if there be anybody in here this evening that does not know you, has never put their faith in you, Lord, never been saved, I pray, God, that they'd come to the uh, 